Salam duslar. This week I'm jumping into sewing my great-great-grandmother's underwear. Let me explain. Historically speaking, underwear is a bit different than what we think of today. I'm a Volga Tatar, and my maternal grandmother helped to raise me, and I was quite close to her growing up. So I've always really identified with being a Volga Tatar. Contrary to common belief, us Volga Tatars are not Slavic. We are a Turkic ethnic minority group indigenous to the Volga Ural region, mainly present-day Tatarstan and Bashkirtistan or Bashkiria, which is the region that my family is from. Many of us are Central Asian, myself included, and there's a lot of deliberation amongst scholars regarding our ethnogenesis, to the point where even now, no one theory is agreed upon. But as an extreme oversimplification, we are said to possess a mix of Turkic and or Mongolian genetics, and some of us also have European genetics mixed in. And naturally, since I'm fascinated by historical fashion and love wearing it, I've been working on collecting the very difficult to find research on Volga Tatar historical fashion. And I've even recently sewed this late 19th century working class Volga Tatar dress. So this time, I'm going to be making some underwear. My grandmother was born in the 1930s, my great-grandmother was probably born around the early 1900s, and therefore my great-great-grandmother would have been alive right around the time period of when this style of underwear that I'm making today would have definitely still been worn by my Volga Tatar ancestors. And I'm going to wear them too. I never learned Tatar growing up, by the way, as the language was lost in my family with my mother's generation, so I'm slowly learning it now, and that has been a revolutionary experience. English actually isn't my first language, fun fact. I was maybe about two or three years old when I started really speaking English, so I've almost always been bilingual, and I have loved learning languages. Not only do they allow us to get closer to our ancestors, but they also connect us to the world and to each other. Being able to work on important projects that bring me closer to my ancestors, like this one, is made possible by the sponsor of today's video, Babbel. I've also been relearning French recently thanks to Babbel, as I studied it for five years in school and even a bit in university, but I forgot a lot of the language, so I've been practicing getting up to speed again because I find French to be very useful. Babbel has taught me useful French phrases like Je m'appelle Vasilisa and L'édition s'il vous plaît, and then more complex topics like how to describe a person's character and personality traits. Sentimental. Sentimental. C'est presque irréel. C'est presque irréel. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world, and their intuitive lessons are designed by real language teachers, and they teach you real-world conversations. The lessons prepare you to have practical conversations about travel, business, relationships, and more. Babbel is scientifically proven to help you start speaking a new language in just three weeks, and they offer a 20-day money-back guarantee. Best of all, Babbel offers a few different subscriptions to choose from, including a lifetime subscription, which is the perfect option for anyone interested in learning multiple languages. For instance, if you're familiar with one romance language and perhaps want to learn some of the others. I often think of autumn as a season of learning, of turning inwards, and thinking about what we really want to spend time doing that is going to be nurturing for us. I find learning languages to be one of the most nurturing activities, personally as they not only expand our minds, but they also equip us with practical skills and connection. Perhaps you'd like to learn a new language this autumn to build a new skill, or maybe even to get closer to your own ancestors. You can get 60% off your subscription with Babbel by using the link in the description box below. Thanks so much to Babbel for sponsoring this video. So the Volga Tatar historical underwear that I'm going to be making, I've found references for in my two books on Tatar historical fashion. As I mentioned earlier, research is extremely limited and even more limited on what undergarments Volga Tatar women in particular wore, but here is what I could dig up. So interestingly enough, both men and women wore the same type of underwear amongst the Volga Tatars. Also, fun fact, in the Tatar language there actually is only one word to describe gender, it's just ul. So it doesn't matter what gender someone is, you would use ul. The primary garment would be a pair of flowy ankle-length trousers, which is referred to in one of my books as pants with a wide step, also referenced simply as ushtan. The sewing of these pants is described as being sewn wide at the waist, ankle length, with no pockets. Not dissimilar to the types of wide trousers that you see amongst other Turkish groups, and even possessing similarities to salwar from India. They're made of various materials according to my books, including linen and silk, as well as cotton. 
Since I want to make a working class version, I think I'm just going to stick with a very lightweight linen cotton blend for my stash. I always thought in my mind that Volga Tatar women wore undershirts beneath their dresses, but the information I found on this is very contradictory. There is this upper garment that both men and women wore, which is described as a tunic-like shirt, very loose and long, with long sleeves and a neck slit. And it is further said that it is closer to the tunics of the Turkish people of Central Asia and Kazakhstan. In the Tatar language, I have seen them called kulmek, which translates now as a dress or a man's shirt. Again, the same word is being used for both. So I assumed a version of this tunic-like shirt would be worn as sort of how a chemise was worn by the Victorians. I figured they'd go over the ishtan, which to me makes sense considering it would likely serve as well to protect the outer garments from deterioration over time. The interesting thing is that outer garments for women are often referred to as tunic-like dresses and follow essentially the same cut, at least during the mid-19th century and earlier. This cut already changes by the later 19th century as European influences really start to change the Volga Tatar women's fashion styles and transforms them more into dresses like the red one that I made. One source I read online expresses that a tunic-like shirt was worn under the dresses potentially, but it is never seen outwardly. But then in one of my books it says, usually a dress had a cotton backing in the upper part, as it was worn directly over a body. So this now makes me think that the dresses would have maybe just been worn directly on the skin over the ishtan, of course, because we know that those were worn by Volga Tatar women, definitely. So ultimately, I don't really know about this under tunic shirt, and I'm going to guess that the truth lies somewhere in between. Potentially some Volga Tatar women may have worn these tunic undershirts whilst maybe others didn't. Maybe as well it depended on the class and access to being able to frequently do laundry. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to only focus on the construction of the ishtan. And this is because I know almost certainly that these were worn by my great-great-grandmother if we consider her ethnicity, and the fact that traditional historical Tatar garments were worn at this time as just normal clothing. I'll have to draft my own pattern, so I have no idea how this is going to go. And I also can't figure out what the back of this garment is because there are no diagrams that really show a very detailed description. So there's going to be some guesswork involved, definitely. But let's see what happens. So I'm going to use the diagram from the book that I have here. You guys probably can't see it. And I've drawn out a little picture of it here using my very mediocre drawing skills to try and figure out what exactly is going on. I can see that here in the front, this here is going to be the length of my leg because these are going to be ankle length. The entire waist will be very wide and then it'll be gathered down. So there should become a lot of room here in the crotch seam area. I have absolutely no idea how this is going to turn out, but uh, I guess that's part of the adventure, isn't it? I think I'm going to go for this shape instead, change of plans, because it just seems a lot more straightforward and then I don't have to figure out what's going on with the back because it's just going to be mimicking whatever's going on in the front. You can see here how everything is basically a rectangle if we consider that the seam is here and then you've got the waist, but then you just have these two pieces which are sort of sewn in like, I guess, gussets almost or gores and they just help to create a little bit extra space here and movement. Also, you can see here a red specimen, which is perfect because I'm going to be using my red fabric. So yeah, that's great. So I spend the next hour or so meticulously plugging in my measurements. I'm a self-taught dressmaker and not especially knowledgeable about drafting. And I'm really only in the first few years of my sewing journey, but intuitively I had a feeling that this plan was just going to work out. I ended up drawing out the basic shapes of the ishtan and devised a formula that when applied to each measurement, I suspected it would give me the proportions of the original antique garment. I knew for a fact that I wanted my outer leg seam measurements to be 35 inches, and when I measured the antique in the photo, its outer leg seam was about three inches. So I divided 35 by three, and it gave me approximately 11.66, which we can just call Y from now on. I then proceeded to measure all the other seams on the photo and multiplied them by our Y value, aka 11.66, and it gave me all the rest of the measurements for the ishtan. This is of course just half of the garment as I needed to double up all the pieces for the front and the back since they mirror one another. I want to experiment in the future as well with creating a version with even more inches added to the waist as I'm curious how that would look gathered down. 
To my surprise, this intuitive method worked and all my numbers ended up quite seamlessly, no pun intended, matching up and it was time to cut the fabric. I am basically working with little scraps of fabric right now, so I have no idea if I'm going to have enough. It is also about 30 degrees Celsius in my house right now, so that's another struggle altogether. That's why I'm not going to iron this fabric because I might just pass out if uh, I have to deal with any more heat right now. But this is what I've got so far. I've been very carefully labeling everything and cutting everything out to the measurements that I've made in addition to adding seam allowances too. And you can see that the shape is really starting to take form. All the shapes of this garment are pretty simple, but the gusset, or I guess gore, I really don't know what to call it, was the most complex bit. I drew this piece out with chalk because snipping and tearing the fabric doesn't exactly work at angles. It was also so boiling hot that I basically had to work in my shift the entire day. We rarely have AC here in Europe. In order to make sure the pattern remained uniform for each gore, I tailor stacked the seam lines carefully. And then I worked up the courage to finally iron all of the pieces. It may have turned from 30 degrees to 33 degrees in my house because of this bravery. I just realized that I forgot to cut these gussets on the bias. So I'm hoping that won't affect the final construction. But to be honest, there is no way I would have had enough fabric to cut these on the bias anyways. So I'm just going to make do with it being cut on the straight grain and see if it works out or not. Worst case scenario, if it doesn't, we're going to be having gussets made from a completely different color of fabric. Well, that's very historically accurate. But the gores that I keep calling gussets cut out on the straight grain did work out, or at least for now, we'll see how the garment wears over time. So I spent the next couple of days hand stitching all of the seams neatly. I used closely spaced back stitches for their strength and durability. Just finished hand sewing this beautiful seam and uh, guess what? I sewed it on backwards. That is indeed a seam on the outside of the garment. <sighs> so I have to unpick the whole thing and um, try this again. <laughs> so I spent the next little while unpicking the seam and eventually managed to figure it all out and get the pieces stitched together, for real this time. Aside from the top of the gores, which ended up getting attached at sort of an angle to the rectangular center insert piece, you can see here how much these will get gathered down to my waist measurement with a drawstring. Plenty of space for maximum comfort. Is this thing on? Yeah, okay, we're good. So I am pleased to report, like two days later, I've finally <laughs> finished stitching all of the seams for the ishtan, which means that now I just have to finish all of the seams since they're still raw and I don't want these unraveling since they're probably gonna get washed a lot, so I definitely need to finish them. Then there's only really two steps left after that. I just need to create the channel of the waistband so that I can do the drawstring and then I need to hem the legs and that's it. And then we're done. It's actually a pretty quick project relatively speaking, because obviously some of them take hundreds of hours and this is definitely like below 40, which is quick in my mind. <laughs> I didn't make a mock-up and I have no idea what they're gonna look like on or even what they're going to look like when they're gathered at the waist. So it's completely a new adventure. And guess what? It finally cooled down today, so I'm not dying. I did exactly that. I finished the inner seams of the garment by turning under the raw edges and using a felling stitch, and then I secured down the ironed hems at the ankles of the ishtan, and also at the waist hem at the top of the undergarment. I've been asked in the past why sometimes in my shots I sew with my left hand and sometimes with my right, and the truth is I'm ambidextrous when it comes to sewing. Some things in life I can only do with my left hand, like writing, other things I can only do with my right, like cutting fabric, but with sewing, I can use either hand. Sometimes when one of my hands gets tired or I can't quite feel comfortable with a sewing angle, I'll switch hands. Lately, I have more of a preference for my right hand, so because of that, my left hand has become much slower. I've been working to bring my left hand more up to speed with my right again, so sometimes I'll switch hands just to practice a little bit. The final step of constructing this garment was to create an opening at the waist for a drawstring to be strung through. Although I originally thought I was going to create buttonholes, I decided against this and instead chose to make hand-sewn eyelets as I felt that they'd be a bit stronger since I'll only be working through one layer of fabric. I had to be very careful when using this awl not to accidentally poke through other layers of fabric and I worked the eyelets with some doubled up silk thread. 
Then I used a bodkin to feed through a silk cord and the shthan were complete. With regards to how the garment turned out, I love the garment because it allows me to feel even closer to my ancestors. It's incredibly comfortable too, and since my ancestors were semi-nomadic, these loose fit shthan would be perfect for riding horses and an active lifestyle working with the land. Although they may not look very flattering, whatever that means, perhaps at least not when seen through a modern lens, I love these ishtan because they mean something to me. I might have no idea what is going on with all the fabric around the crotch area, but the meaning behind them goes far deeper than aesthetic. Besides, isn't comfort the top priority when it comes to underwear anyways? Plus, now I have a cute matching set to go along with my dress. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video and that you've learned some new things about us Volga Tatars. If you'd like to see everything I made in my third year sewing, be sure to watch this video next. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in two weeks for another video.